Hi, and welcome to Widow Talk, real conversations about the stuff people just don't talk about. My name is Lauren Leslie Carr, and I've been widowed nine years now. Joining me today is Angela Bassard. Angela was widowed in 2013 when she lost her husband, David, to depression after 16 years of marriage and four children together. Welcome, Angela. Thank you for chatting with me today. Thank you. You've faced some really significant emotional challenges in your widowhood. So just to give our viewers a snapshot, I'm going to list some of the ones that we're going to be um, taking a look at today. Uh, so shortly after losing your husband, you lost your brother to cancer mm -hmm. and uh, you navigated a new relationship. Your daughter was diagnosed with a critical illness. And uh, if that wasn't enough, you had to endure some pretty harsh judgment and criticism in the form of some really nasty anonymous letters. Um, yes. So that's a lot. Um, to start, can you tell us a little bit about David and um, when, you, when you discovered that he was gone? Yeah. Um, so yeah, as you said, David and I had been together a long time. I was only 19 when we met, so um, I didn't really know adulthood without him in it. Um, I was aware that he had been struggling with depression. Um, it was um, many years <laughs> of dealing with that, some years um, where he was willing to accept help, other years, um, particularly towards the end, where he was totally closed off from, from anyone helping him, including me. Um, I had no idea that he was contemplating what he was going to do. I actually thought that he was in a bit of a good place at that point. <laughs> um, so losing him um, rocked my world, pulled the carpet out from underneath me, um, didn't know how I was going to ever have enough to be able to continue raising four children, um, both emotionally and physically and financially. Like, you know, that's, it's very scary in those initial stages. Um, he had been a fantastic dad. Um, the, my um, older three, you know, had had them, had had him in their life for a long time, and he was the the type of dad that went to all the the soccer matches, sat at the cricket the whole day, and um, you know, nothing was too hard for for the kids. Um, my daughter was only three when he passed away, so she doesn't have the same. She didn't have the same relationship with. Um, her dad that the older three had. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, in, in those initial stages as a parent, you can't just um, concentrate on your own grief. Um, you've got children there who all um, deal with it and lash out, I suppose, in all different ways. Yeah. Um, so that, that was very complicated, very hard, but um, I made the decision very early on that I would do whatever I could to keep life as normal as possible for my kids because they didn't deserve any of what was going on. So to me, for a long time, they were the most important um, to get through this first. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's not something that anyone can ever plan for. <laughs> um, no matter how you lose a spouse, you have no concept of what you as an individual will go through um, no matter how they've passed. Yeah, yeah. Now you lost your brother um, shortly after. So how, how long after losing your husband did your, your brother pass? And 
how did that impact you when you were already in such yeah. trauma and grief? Yeah, so my brother found out three weeks after David passed that he had throat cancer. Okay. Um, he was also a solo dad himself, raising three children. Um, he fought as hard as he could, um, chemo, radiation, the whole story. Um, in the December, he had finished treatment and, you know, everyone was really excited that, you know, now we just had to get him healthy. Um, then by the second week of February, they had confirmed that he had um, lung cancer that was terminal um, and he passed in May. So it was 10 and a bit months between losing David and then losing my brother. And my brother had played a very integral role in my life and the life of my children. Um, our children, all um, the older ones were all about the same age, had spent, you know, most weekends, if not all weekends together, doing things, playing cricket together, the older two, um, continually having sleepovers. So it was another big hit, not just to me and my parents and other siblings, but also to my children to, um, I guess, face, immortality, face mortality again at yeah. such an early age. And how did you cope with that? Like what sorts of supports did you have in place and how did you deal with that? Um, I very soon after um, losing David realised that I was not capable of sorting the jumble in my head myself. Mm -hmm. um, so started pretty intense counselling from about the fourth week. Right. Um, I was going three times a week for at least an hour each time. Um, I don't believe that I would be as sane as what I am now if I hadn't have done that. Yeah. Um, not that they take away the grief or, or tell you what to think or anything like that, but rather the counsellor that I had spent a lot of time getting me to process the thoughts that were going through my head. Yeah. Um, I knew with what my brother was facing that I didn't want to rely on family heavily because I believed at that time my brother needed that support, not me. Um, so one of the things that I did do was use some of my savings to um, bring in an overseas au pair to live with us for, or um, well, the first one stayed nine months. So um, she was a godsend. <laughs> um, yeah. She lived this whole experience with us. The kids and I were still pretty raw when, when she arrived. Um, she had been warned. <laughs> she knew what, what she was coming into. Um, but she supported me all the way through getting to the hospital as much as I could to spend time with my brother. Um, you know, nothing was too hard in the... Um, final weeks of my brother's life, she even said to me, just go, I'll, I'll sort the kids. When you're here, you're here. When you're not, you're not. So that was a big help. But I also connected with um, some other widows um, yep. in the, the local area um, fairly early on, um, mm -hmm. met them through one of the Facebook groups. Um, and went, yeah, went to several breakfasts and lunches and things like that. And it was good just to sit there for those couple of hours with people who got it. Yeah. Um, I also did meet a couple of people that, whose partners had died by suicide. And it was a bit of a, I'm not a freak 
moment. <laughs> um, meeting yeah. and being able to talk to um, others who were experiencing similar journeys. Yeah. Um, I am still Facebook friends with all of them now. Um, there was another widow um, whose partner had passed by can <laughs> through cancer. Um, and we, the two of us met regularly um, and supported each other. So it's been, you know, really nice to have those friends that it doesn't matter what you say, <laughs> they're not going to judge you. They're not, you, you know, that you're not going to get the comments like it's, you know, time you got your life together or it's time to move on or <laughs> any of those typical uneducated things that people say to you or just advice when you just think yeah you you know that what I'm going through so yeah no it's uh, it's reaching out to other widowed people has definitely been a help for me and so many other people um, in our situation as well so thank yeah, you yes yeah um now You've been fortunate to um, repartner with your with your lovely partner Noel, and he's been a tremendous yes. support to you. Can you explain um, how and when um, that relationship started to grow, and um, the emotional work that it took for you to take that step? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I am very lucky. I think I'm one of the fortunate ones. <laughs> Um, to meet someone that um, has accepted me, warts and all. Uh, I met Noel four months after David passed away. And even though I was had not even considered going into a relationship with someone, um, we formed a friendship to start with. Um, and he supported me through a lot of the first 12 months yeah. so you know you know the first year of of being friends I'm not even going to say partners at that stage because in the beginning we weren't um but he was there through all of the trauma with my brother he would you know ask me every time I was going to the hospital whether he wanted I wanted him to come with me and and things like that I definitely did push him away a lot yeah. in the beginning. Um, I guess for a number of reasons, some of it was my head going, this is not the right thing, this is not the right thing, but my head also going, but he's a really nice person, you yeah. shouldn't be doing this. Um, but also from um, inappropriate comments from other people, um about you know why are you meeting with another man you only been widowed a short period of time um what are you doing this for are you looking for a father for your children um that was the one that definitely made me push him away um and i kept a very thick protective bubble around not only me yeah. but my children for a very long time um, and didn't let him into that bubble very mm. much mm. at all. Um, my older children had not known that their dad was suffering from depression. Okay. So I had made a pact with them that I would do everything I could to be open and honest with them. So I decided the second time that I was actually going out to dinner with Noel that I would tell my older two in particular what I was doing so that they couldn't um, feel like I'd let them down. Um, I did a typical mum thing and cornered the two of them when we were in the car. So they, they had no choice but to talk to me <laughs> and explained that I had met this person that I was at that stage considering a friend and that he had 
invited me to go out to dinner and that you know, I thought that it would be a nice thing to do, mm -hmm. but if either of them had a problem with me doing it, I would like that would be it because they come first, no matter what. And how did they um, respond? <laughs> yeah, both of them in the car were like, "Why are you saying this to us? Why, you know, <laughs> we don't understand." But my eldest came back to me about half an hour later and he said, um, Mum, I don't have any problem with you going out with someone else. And I'm like, oh, hang on, it's friends. <laughs> it's not going out. And he goes, yeah, but you know what I mean. I don't have a problem with it as long as we get to meet him. Yeah. I'm like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> I'm not ready for this, but I had to make myself ready for this because that was what my children, that, that was my children's condition. And looking back, I guess it's more that they wanted to be comfortable, that I wasn't meeting with a stranger who, yeah, yeah. <laughs> wouldn't do the right thing. Yeah. So my kids actually met Noel um, very early on in the piece even before we were in a relationship rather than a friendship yeah. <laughs> as yeah. such. Um, and similarly, I met Noel's kids and all the kids met. <laughs> yeah. um, which is very strange <laughs> when I look back, <laughs> but that's what my kids needed from me at the time. Okay. So, yeah. um, it's even though he met my kids very early on, I kept a um, very thick wall around my kids. And I guess in many ways, I stopped a relationship from developing between my kids and him for a very long time. Mm. Um, and I don't think that I even let those walls down three years later when Noel moved in with us. I think it was when my daughter got sick that um, yeah. I finally let him in. <laughs> so um, let's talk about your daughter now um, and the circumstances around um, how she became critically ill. Yeah. yeah. So we had all known that she was not well. Um, Christmas before she um, finally got all of her diagnosis, we had, I had weighed and measured all of my children. So she at the time weighed 32 kilos. She was eight years old, so normal, mm -hmm. um, you know, healthy, child at that point. Um, something happened in the month after that, that we now know she must have had a, a viral infection. Um, the next six months, she lost seven kilos. Yeah. She stopped sleeping. Most of the night she would be up going to the toilet or getting a drink. Um, she became withdrawn, she um, was grumpy and irritable constantly, um, would fall asleep in the one kilometre drive from school to home. Wow. He had started dancing competitively at this time. So all of the things that we were seeing, we were sort of uh, you know, it must be the effect of going from exercising twice a week to five to six times a week. Sure. But yep. Yep. that still didn't settle my mind. And I remember saying to all the mothers at dance, I remember saying to my parents, something's wrong with her, but I can't work it out. Mm. We'd been to the doctor a couple of times. Nothing was picked up. Um, then the June, July school holidays came. 
she had a funny turn on the first Saturday after drinking a Slurpee. Okay. Um, and then she was staying with my parents for the first week of school holidays. She was becoming more and more withdrawn in that week. Um, my parents and my brother and his children couldn't convince her to get off the couch. All she wanted to do was lie on the couch and sleep. By the Friday afternoon, I took her to a local GP mm -hmm. who said to me, um, I don't want you to wait for the ambulance. He had said what he thought it was, but I had no idea what that was. Right. He said, I want you to get in the car and I want you to drive directly to the children's hospital. You're not stopping to get a drink. You're not stopping to get clothes. You're not stopping to put petrol in the car, nothing. Oh, yeah. So he had come out to see what car I was driving and he called ahead to the children's hospital to explain what he thought was going on and to give them the details of the car that I was in. So when we pulled up at the children's hospital, we had the triage nurse and the registrar waiting for us. We were taken straight in within two minutes of being at the hospital. There was needles being put in her everywhere. And they started asking questions about whether anyone in the family had type 1 diabetes. Um, it, the realisation dawned on me pretty quickly that this is what we were facing. Mm -hmm. um, she needed to go to the bathroom but refused to use the bedpan. So um, she held on, held on, held on. All these tests happening on her, doctors coming in and out. Um, my partner, Noel, had turned up at this time because um, he had um, been messaging when I was at the doctor and I was telling him what was going on. They agreed for me to take her to the bathroom. Um, when she got up off the toilet, she told me she was going to vomit, which she did. Um, it was all straight black so I grabbed her under the arms because I knew she wasn't in a good way mm -hmm. and at that point she went limp in my arms and became unconscious. Um, so we had medical staff running from everywhere and um, them trying to get more cannulas in her and within half an hour we were in intensive care. Um, and that's where we stayed for a while. Um, so she had gone into diabetic ketoacidosis. Her organs had been starting to shut down because of the chemical her body was releasing from having undiagnosed type 1 diabetes. Yeah. So we were at the hospital for a lengthy stay where we learnt the new norm um, for her and really the rest of the family. Um, she is insulin dependent. She has a minimum of five injections a day, which we had to learn to do. Yeah. Was very scary. Um, and the Nights in particular at the hospital, when you're a solo parent <laughs> and you can't pass the responsibility to someone, even for five minutes, is tough. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes, there were other people around me. There were really good friends of mine who, you know, what can we do to help? Um, Noel was popping in and out between work. Um, my parents, but it's not the same. No. Um, and like, as as a widow, um, like, what were your thoughts um, toward David at this point? Like, it's his daughter that's in this situation, and you're the yeah. one that's there yeah. going through there it. There was a lot of anger. 
um, anger at him because he hadn't fought his disease to be here to support her. Mm. Um, and in my eyes, a parent should be there to do whatever what, whatever is needed for a child. Mm. So there was a lot of anger that he had not done that for her, that he had not fought to be there for her when she needed it. Mm. And her brothers, for when they needed it, because they were struggling with what she was going through as well. Oh, he'd all been through so much, like even before that, with the loss of the brother, their uncle, and now to face something like that, that's... Because um, she could have... You could have lost her in that in that. Yes. Situation. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we, um, we could have if we didn't have a good GP that had identified all of the symptoms and pieced it together as quickly as what he did. Um, I don't think if we were sent home that we would have had her the next morning. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that was pretty rough, me having to call my sons to tell them mm -hmm. that I won't be home. <laughs> yeah. I've taken your sister to the hospital. Um, you know, they wanted to know that she was going to be okay. And at that point, I couldn't give that to them. Yeah. Um, my eldest in, partic in particular, he has very much so at his own doing taken on the role of the father figure in her life because there is 10 years between them. So when I rang and told him, he just burst into tears and couldn't actually speak to me to find out what was going on. He had to put his girlfriend on um, so that I could tell her everything that was going on. She could calm him down and then explain to him that, you know, he, my daughter was in best place that she could possibly be and that they would do everything to, to get her through this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but anyone that knows type one diabetes knows that it doesn't go away. Yeah. This is a constant farce. Mm -hmm. um, some weeks it's like having a newborn baby. Some weeks, some nights I can be up to her three or four times between 10 o'clock at night and six o'clock in the morning. Yeah. yeah, that's just the way it is. And we don't have her dad here <laughs> to yes. help with that. Um, so yeah, I, resentment towards him, um, yeah. anger towards him, but also anger that why was I the one that was made go through this all by myself? Yeah, yeah, no, I think there's lots of, we know people out there that could definitely relate to that. Um, so you're definitely not alone there. Um, another common experience for people that are widowed by suicide, um, and even you know widowed people who repartner or carry on raising their children, they uh, get judgment and criticism from other people for however it is that they're yeah, carrying on with their life. Um, but you had to uh, cop that in a really just disturbing, as far as I'm concerned, and intrusive way in, in these anonymous letters that you were receiving. So can you let us know um, when that started occurring and how you dealt with that? Yeah. So three months after David passed away, I received the first of a series of letters yeah. via the mail, the first one, and it was anonymous. I still to this day do not know who they'd come from, yeah. but there was a lot of accusations do you, do you suspect anyone or just still genuinely in the dark? Um, the content of some of the letters 
tells me that it's someone that's that was or still is i don't know in our inner circle right. there was detail in the letters that you wouldn't have no someone wouldn't have known yep. unless they had known david and i together for a long time right so the first letter sorry i think it hurt even more knowing that it like suspecting that it's someone quite close to you um it, in the beginning it definitely did yeah um it a lot of the counseling time <laughs> in the first month, particularly after the first couple, um, were spent trying to get me to process what was in those letters. Mm. Um, and it wasn't till probably after the sixth communication that I had that my family convinced me, my immediate family convinced me that I needed to take them to the police. Um, and my counsellor and one of the police officers that I dealt with who had experienced others going through similar things, mm -hmm. that I realised this was more about the headspace of who was sending the letters rather than me. Okay. Um, so in the letters, I was accused of being an alcoholic. I was accused of having a relationship with Noel before David had passed away, even though I received the first letter before I'd even met Noel. Um, there, in one of the initial letters, they had said that they were going to do everything they could to have my children taken away from me. God, that's horrible. Um, called in family services on me. Um, so I had a couple of visits from family services. I had to go to the schools to get attendance records to show family services that my kids were not missing out on school. Um, yeah, <laughs> they're pretty disturbing. One of them, one of the letters was left at David's gravesite on Christmas Day. Um, and I was just lucky that a friend had gone to the cemetery before me and had seen it and taken it away so that my children didn't have to be subjected to that on Christmas Day. Um, it's pretty scary to receive communication like that. Um, you get to the point that you're looking over your shoulder all the time. You mm. don't know who it's come from. You don't know where the next one's going to come from. You don't know if the letters is going to be to the full extent of what this person is going to do. Exactly, yeah. Um, it just it seems like a very messed up thing to do. That, that It would make me very afraid that it would take... Yes. <laughs> Get, go up a notch in, in yes yeah. um i even in the beginning i even went to the extent of getting a big scary dog <laughs> um who is not a big scary dog she's a big softy <laughs> but you know that was one layer of protection that i could put between my kids and myself and whoever it was that was doing this yeah. um because my head was going to the, well, what if they just turn up and try to take the kids off me? Or what if they turn up and try to attack one of us? Or, um, yeah. Horrible. Yeah, it, um, I had a lot of problems with separation from my kids mm -hmm. um, because of that. Because um, in my mind, they were safest when they were with me. Yeah. Um, as a result, my daughter ended up with separation anxiety when she started school because she had not been away from me. And um, to this day, rears its head every now and again. Um, and I do put that all back to me pulling the kids in tight after getting these communications. 
they continued for 18 months um, before the police officer that I was working with got me to put a post on all of my social media um, with particular words, um, you know, like anonymous communication is actually a criminal offence um, with a maximum seven year jail sentence if someone's caught. Um, you know, it was particular wording that they got me to put on there. Mm -hmm. And that was the trigger for whoever it was to stop. Okay. Yeah. But 18 months of this was pretty tough going. Yeah. Where do you sit with all that today? Like, have you sort of let go of that or? Um, yeah. Because if it was me, I'd, just, I'd want to dig, dig, dig and find out, which is probably not a healthy thing. I mean, as you yeah. say, the letters were probably some, some person's grief and anger. Um, yeah. Yeah, where do you sit with all that today? Um, I am okay with it now. <laughs> I can't say that I was okay with it for a long time. Um, I would look at people's handwriting whenever I got cards from anyone to see if there was similar handwriting in in other communications. Um, I, I, I guess I withdrew from a lot of family and friends for a long time because of it, because I didn't know who it was. Yeah. Um, but then I started looking for signs of, no, it can't be that friend because it can't be that brother because it can't be that person because. Yeah. Um, so in my mind, I spent a lot of time weeding out the people who I didn't believe mm. it was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that took me a long time to be comfortable spending time with family and friends. You know, it wasn't just the the usual grief that we all go through of not wanting to go out, not wanting to mingle with people, but there was a fear in there as well that anything I said or did or, you know, down to what, what I was wearing because in the first six months I lost 15 kilos. <laughs> Um, so suddenly I was fitting into skinny clothes, <laughs> um, you know, and I would wear oversized clothes because I didn't want anyone to think that, you know, I was change, changing my wardrobe and, yeah, it makes you take or made me take a look at my whole life and how it fitted together. Um, and I guess in many ways, that's probably why I liked um, meeting other widows or people who hadn't known me before we lost David um, because they didn't know the story. I knew that the letters couldn't have come from them. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 I wasn't going to be judged like I was being judged yeah. from... Yeah. Someone. <laughs> and what's your grief like today specifically um, for David? Look, it will never go away. Um, I would be lying if I said it, it you know, is not there. Yeah. There'll be little triggers that um, will either set me off bawling <laughs> or make me have to run to a bathroom and just hide away for five minutes. Or even in the car when something comes on the radio that I knew was one of his favorite songs, the tear will, will escape the eye. Um, and no one, no one else knows <laughs> what that tear was for. Or, you know, most people I don't think I even see that, that would even see that. Um, I do struggle when there's a milestone for one of my children, um, mm. the boys graduating high school. Um, 
most of the mothers are there crying. <laughs> but my crying was very different. My crying was because their dad was not there to see this. Their dad was not there to um, participate in, you know, this next stage of their life and never would be. Yeah. Um, rather than uh, they're moving to the next stage of their life. Yeah. So it makes you take a look at things very differently to if you hadn't been through losing a partner. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Angela, you've been through so much and I really, really admire your strength and how open you've been um, in sharing these experiences with our community because um, I, I know it will be a great benefit um, to other people. So I just want to thank you so much. But before you go, um, what would be your advice to um, a widow person who's quite new in their loss and um, has all of this ahead of them, what would your advice be? Um, don't stop living. Don't shut your heart off from the world because there are some good people out there. Um, whether it's a friend or a new partner down the track, they're, they're special people in your life post being a widow, <laughs> post becoming a widow, come from the people that you would least expect. Yeah. Um, don't hide away. Don't hide your grief. Don't try to lock your grief away in a wardrobe because it will come back and get you. Yeah. Um, when you need to cry, cry. When you need to be angry, be angry. Get in the shower and scream. <laughs> Um, but don't stop living because none of our partners would want us to stop living. Yeah. No, that's so beautiful. Angela, thank you so much. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> to our viewers, um, please reach out to um, other widowed people. Uh, you can reach out to our organisation. We have a um, Facebook group and a private forum for members. Our website is www.firstlight.org.au and please feel free to check out more of our Widow Talk interviews. Uh, that's all from us. Have a great day.